Hello, welcome to Art Salon. I'm Ellie Shore and I've been hosting and organizing Art Salons for nine years now, since 2012. Um, most of that time we've met in person at the Armory Art Center in West Palm Beach. And now of course we're meeting virtually on Zoom. Art Salons began because I envisioned a place where people who were interested in contemporary art could meet and the Armory agreed to host it. The idea has just continued to grow since then. Each art salon features one of the leading contemporary artists practicing in South Florida today. And they share their work and talk about their art practices. After each presentation, there's a chance for all of us to share our thoughts, our experiences, and ask whatever questions we have. So please hold your comments until then. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the people who helped to make these art salons possible. The administration and staff at the Armory Art Center, Ezra Hubbard, whose generous donation has allowed us to make these salons free, and my husband, Jerry Kornbluth, who provides technical support and who records each of these salons and posts them afterwards on my website. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our artist this evening, Onajide Shabaka. He's a Miami-based artist, curator, educator, cultural producer, and writer. His work often begins with a walk or a hike, whether out in nature or in the urban environment. The work weaves together the natural world he finds in each place with the people living there and with African Atlantic history and culture. It's an art practice focused on facilitating thought, introspection, and discussion. So please now welcome Onajide Shabaka. Hi there. Good evening. Thank you for uh, being here this evening. Um, normally I'm not really that nervous, but I, my, my father passed recently and so you know that's still kind of in my head you know to just preparation just was not as good as i would like but you know i'm not going to make any more excuses that's enough um so anyway thank you for uh for participating so my little talk is about walking faith and failure and as ellie said most artists don't talk about failure, but if there's anybody in this audience who can claim that they have never had a failure is a stone cold liar, right? Every single one of us has had failures and will continue to have failures. And I'll talk more about that, but I, I do want to say one thing that I, a friend of mine who I met through the tech community posted on his Instagram actually today, and it said, failure is the mother of success. And so anyway, let's, uh, let's move on. I've been an artist for many decades. I guess part of the reason why I don't have a problem with talking about failure is because, you know, I am now 73 years old. And what I have thought that I would reach this age when I was 20, you know, I don't know. But uh, anyway, I've been an artist and cultural practitioner for all those decades. I started walking when I was in high school and uh, walking not only contributes to my art practice, but also contributes to my health. I have been on a number of uh, residencies and cultural exchanges. And uh, I've tried to take all of those things and fold them into my art practice, my cultural practice, um, and my research. And um, all of those things contribute to who I am. And hopefully this talk is informed by that. These are some of the images of the places that I've been. Guadalupe, Mexico, Jamaica, and Suriname. And most recently, um, I was at the uh, Anderson Ranch Center as part of the Ulite Arts Home and Away Residency. 
that was a very beautiful residency. You know, there was a, an art center with uh, staff there to help you or help anyone that was there to try different things. You know, I didn't really necessarily try different things. I kind of went back to some of the things that I had been doing in the past, which is printmaking. But they were, you know, there were people there that had never done ceramics. And so they were throwing pots, which, you know, is fun. You know, I love, I love ceramics. I started walking while I was in high school without knowing such a thing existed. But walking stays in my life and is the largest creative energy source that moves my art and my research. I began seeking beauty of botanicals growing in the arid Southern California, uh, but quickly opened to other ecological environments and continue to do so from the arboreal north woods, uh, meaning uh, Minnesota and uh, Oregon, to the tropical Amazon, which is uh, Suriname. This is, um, okay, I mentioned that my father had uh, died. And uh, while I was cleaning up, looking around for whatever that was there, you know, just kind of searching through the house, I came across this photograph that I did in the 1960s. This was in an area that's now called uh, Carson, California. At the time that we were living in the area, as you can see, there are no houses. This was a new area. It was formerly farmland and people were complaining about the plants that were there, the so-called weeds, but none of them had ever gone out there and looked at it. And so I was out there taking photographs. And um, anyway, I gave this photograph and a couple others to my father. And I had totally forgotten that I had given them to him and that he had actually kept them. Uh, but anyway, so this is one of the photographs from probably one of the earliest photographs that I've taken when I started calling myself a quote unquote artist photographer. So how do we talk about failure again? So, you know, there are the artist's efforts to attain goals and uh, reach a successful practice. So, you know, there's a recognition of attainment by, you know, yourself by other people, by people that you collaborate with. Of course, I've also had people that hinder my success and that have actually blocked my success. And is that a result of their own failure that they didn't want somebody to have success because they were so locked into their failure? I don't know. Then of course there are impediments to success that are said about by others, sometimes on purpose, sometimes systemically, but sometimes it's just the general circumstances that things are not going to be successful because we don't have enough information about how to make something a success. Sometimes we have mischosen our goals. And by that, you know, thinking about a timeline. So, you know, okay, so this, project has to be done within, you know, three months. But the reality of it is that the project is really a six month project and not a three month project. So is it really a failure or just you have missed chosen your goals? It could be both. So going back to my youth, <laughs> I'm laughing now because, you know, it's just so amazing, you know, to, to look back in time, the image on the left, the silk screen, I was still living in Los Angeles at that time and had a friend um, named Dan Contralar who uh, was one of the uh, main uh, African Latino artists that were living in Los Angeles. And, um, you know, we both did a similar work, I mean, in terms of the imagery. And, and so I knew that my father had this but I wasn't sure how well shape it was in, but you know, it's in good shape. So I, I'm happy that he had it. The, the image on the right, I don't really do street photography. I've attempted to do street photography, but that's not really, I mean, I'm the person that's walking. I'm not the person that's out there looking at people, you know, surreptitiously taking photographs of people and things. 
But this particular day, because I had a real big camera too. So this particular day, I walked into the train station and walked up the ramp and the train was leaving right at that very moment. Now, I don't know if anybody knows how Los Angeles is designed, but we all know the name Sunset Boulevard. Well, Sunset Boulevard actually starts in downtown Los Angeles and it starts actually one block east of where this train is. So the train station is really downtown. This is a, what they call a Union Station. And it was just beautiful that that puff of smoke came out of the back when I took the photograph. I always remember that as being a really good street photography moment, you know? So there was success, you know, <laughs> as opposed to failure. <laughs> We also had another image that I had a silk screen. Actually, it was a woodcut, the black, red, and white on the left. I had totally forgotten that I did this, but he had it. And I do kind of remember the, the jagged diamond edge. I do kind of remember doing that, but the rest of it, I don't really have a strong memory of doing it, but I signed it. So my name is there. So I know I did it. And so I, I reproduced this. So this is a second edition of that. This is done as a silk screen. The original was done as a woodcut. And then the image to the right, George Wallace, who was a former governor of the state of Alabama, a very racist person who believed in segregation today, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. That was his motto. And um, I had a copy of that myself and had some little damage on the one edge from water but I had that myself. So I'm, I'm happy about those. Those are successes. And in speaking about success or failure, you know, how do I categorize that? You know, I have studied photography since I was in high school. I have a bachelor's degree in photography. I had a very difficult time getting any photographic work of mine shown. As a matter of fact, in the San Francisco Bay Area, it was probably some of the most racist experiences I've ever had. And not just because I was young and inexperienced, because people still need to show some courtesy in their dealings with other human beings. And I didn't have that. But anyway, these are some of the photographs that I've taken over the years, just a small selection. It was actually part of an exhibition at uh, Nova Southeastern Art Museum. Uh, it was called 37 Years, that's 37 years of images. So I took eight by tens and just spread a whole wall in a grid fashion of 37 years of photographs. And this is one of the photographs that was there. This photograph was taken in 1970. This was a transitional period after I had gone to uh, Art Center, College of Design. I took a photography class there. I uh, wanted to continue photography, but you know they said I had to wait a year because there were no openings. So I decided to go to California College of the Arts instead. But in that you know six month of time where I wasn't in school at all, I, I took this photograph. And um, it was done with um, what they call extension tubes, but it gives a macro effect. And I, I love macro. I've been doing macro ever since. I still do macro. Anyway, that's 1970. So between 1976, I moved to Florida in 1976. And 1989 were years in hiatus from art making due to racism. Some of those years are spent designing and constructing men's and women's clothes. And actually, if I'm gonna say that, I really should go all the way back to 1974. I believe I started doing the men's and women's clothes, started studying the fashion design in 1974. And anyway, having studied formerly the craft there in San Francisco, other years were spent bicycle racing on the national amateur level. The last full year that I raced, I spent six months in Italy, which was a fantastic place. The people were fantastic. The food was fantastic. The location was fantastic. It was about 50 kilometers from Venice, right in the foothills of the Dolomites. And while I was there in Italy, I said to myself that I need to return to my art practice. Something inspired me to say that. 
to myself. And so that's what I did. But I ended up going into uh, Fort Pierce, Florida, where my family had moved. And one of the things about Fort Pierce, actually all of Florida, is the mangroves. When I first saw mangroves, I was just totally shocked at this mesh of roots. And I've become enamored by the environment, even though it can be lots of bugs and mosquitoes and insects, but there's also fish and snakes and turtles and other kinds of creatures in there and the smells, the, the salt water smell. I mean, it's just an amazing place. It really is. Some of the other places that I have been, um, like I said, I, I've been to Minnesota and these are three pictures from Minnesota. One of them there with the pictograph, it's a Hegman Lake. That's a, I forget which uh, native population is that is attributed to, but anyway, that's Hegman Lake. And then you see underneath of that picture is some animal poop, most likely a wolf. There are lots of wolves in uh, Northern Minnesota. And I'm gonna say this to you, people because I, I people always ask me why am I taking pictures of animal poop and the reason is because if you are out there in the woods where all those trees are you know those animals that are out there they see you but you don't see them and so if I see poop then I have some idea of what animals are in the environment and so I take pictures of, of deer poop, cow poop, you know, if there's cows around, you know, I mean, because it all looks different, you know, and I need to be able to identify it when I'm out there. Of course, they call it scat. But anyway, and one of the amazing things about Minnesota, aside from the large forest, is that the beavers are engineers. And on the left is a beaver dam. You know, sometimes they help with uh, the environment, but then there are other times where they, you know, create some problems, but they, they love to pull down the trees and make dams. They, they, they're engineers. They do a fantastic job of that. And also mushrooms. I, I, you know, find mushrooms extremely fascinating. They're not plants and they're not animals, but they're, they're mushrooms. And, and I have photographed them and drawn them and painted them and I don't know, they're just fascinating. But they're also what helps that forest be what it is because the mycelium that they create on the floor of the forest enables the various trees and plants to communicate and transmit not only signals, electrical signals, but also food back and forth. So they are some of the main instruments in keeping a healthy forest. One of the other things, actually the first thing that I did when I was on my way up to that area there in the forest was stop along the side of the road to get a coffee cup, and it was raining outside, and scoop up into a coffee cup this reddish brown soil that I saw on the side of the road, dirt, mud. And my friend was looking at me like I was crazy. I don't know if he's on here tonight, but... I've told this story before, but it's a beautiful color. This red oxide is just beautiful. And I've used it in my art practice since I first discovered it in 1979. And that's the way I, I do. So when I walk and I find things, then I try to incorporate that into my art practice like I did with this mud. And I still have a lot of it because, you know, today I wouldn't be able to transport that on the airplane. But in those days I could. I also um, have to thank Diaspora Vibe Cultural Arts Incubator, Rosie Gordon Wallace, because her initiative in helping artists and helping me specifically is something that, I mean, I don't know that I have the words to really express my gratitude for what she has done for me. It's, I'm, I'm thankful every day because of her vision. So here are three photographs from uh, San Miguel de Allende. I was on a residency uh, 
through her. I was the only person there. I do speak a little Spanish. I speak enough Spanish to eat. <laughs> but I went there's outside of San Miguel. There's this little small pyramid that's really um, sitting on a plateau that's really beautiful. And all around on this plateau, on the right hand corner of this screen you're looking at are some medicinal plants. And on this plateau are growing all kinds of medicinal plants. So this was a community that was living there and they had devised an irrigation system so that the water, when it rained, would stay there so they would have water, wouldn't have to go down to the river to gather water. So they were able to manage to live there the majority of the year without having to go far to get water. It was another, like I said, a beautiful experience to be able to do that. And then also with Rosie, I went to uh, Suriname. I went there in 2016. And uh, on the left is from 2016. And on the right is from 2017, when I actually went into the Amazon. There are no roads to the area where I went. So we had to take a car up until a certain point in the river. It was like four hours in a car, another four hours in a boat upriver. I'd say probably one of the things that I did that I would call a failure on my part. And as a student at California College of the Arts, I designed these on the right-hand side, these two pictures. And the bottom one was one that I had made into a stool, actually having looked at hand-carved stools from the country of Ghana, Ashanti people, speaking people, Ashanti language, and Suriname. And this was in 1971. So between 1971 and 2016, I had totally forgotten about, you know, Suriname until I was there for a couple of days and all of a sudden, wow, I remembered. So I had the drawing, but I threw away the stool, which I wish I had kept now, but unfortunately it's gone. Just, you know, another thing, you know, artists just carry around stuff for decades, you know. And this was made by one of the village elders. So while I was there um, the first time, 2016, uh, I wanted to come back to visit in 2017. And so I was doing some research to figure out kind of what I was going to do. And I discovered the first rice that was brought to the Americas was smuggled in the hair of enslaved women. And so I was determined to find out where this rice was growing and what it looked like and all this kind of stuff. So I did as much research as I could. I get back to Suriname and within three days of arrival, you know, I was told, yes, we can find the rice, but you know, we have to go this weekend because they're harvesting the last of it. And so, you know, within a week I was there looking at the rice and it was being grown by this village elder who carved this particular stool. But he also knew of all kinds of other medicinal plants that were growing around the area which I identified as I'm walking. And, you know, then he, through the young man who was translating for me, starts talking about what the various medicinal plants were good for. But, you know, you, there's no way to take notes when you're walking and you don't have any way to do that and take photographs and make notes all at the same time. But, you know, hopefully I can get back after this uh, sequestration is totally finished and um, that I can, you know, learn a little bit more. So there on the left is a piece of cloth that I bought there in the market. The local people have uh, ways of doing these serpentine designs. I don't know how they're, what they're based on. I didn't really ask anybody. At the time I was there, I wasn't really doing that. I wasn't looking at that. The one on the right is uh, actually a door that was being thrown away. And it was retrieved by the Dutch colonial government because uh, Suriname used to be a Dutch colony and now put into the museum. And so this was retrieved. It's got a, cr a big crack in it there somewhere, but it's been repaired. What I saw when I was in Suriname were ant and termite colonies that have these kind of open architecture and these various mushrooms, not only the one that I'm showing there, but others as well. Again, I, I, lo I look at mushrooms, I love mushrooms. But, you know, looking at the architecture from the insect 
I discovered that the brilliance of nature in that in order for the queen in both colonies, ants and termites, to be at the right temperature so that she can then bear more young has to be maintained. And they do that by changing the shapes and openings or closing of the various tunnels. Ants and termites both do that. And so, you know, I became really fascinated by how in nature, you know, certain kinds of systems are created and root systems that are created by plants as well that, you know, are, are beyond the control of, of humans in general. Although I did see an article today where there was some uh, mathematical formulas that had been investigated in terms of growth of teeth and horns and different things like that. But, you know, it's, it's like math. So when people say, when young kids say that, you know, math is boring, you know, I mean, they, they have no idea because the world runs on math. So again, here's uh, Suriname on the left is uh, two women who were planting rice. Now this rice was Asian rice and it was not in the same area where the African rice was. The other rice that I wanted to see had been brought in from uh, the Western region of Ivory Coast. A Dutch biologist took some back to Europe and did a DNA species analysis on it and discovered that it was from the Western region of Ivory Coast. Without being a hybrid species, it's pure. And that's because the rice is not eaten. Even though you can eat it, they don't eat it. It's used as offerings to the ancestors. So it's like a heritage crop. And so then the next thing I did was look at South Carolina, Georgia, where rice was also grown. Enslaved people were brought from the same areas that were brought into Suriname because they had skill how to grow rice. And this is not really close enough to the ocean to see it, but you know, there's a process called tidal cultivation where you have to be able to prevent the salt water from getting into the crops. So just think about this as being like five miles to the Atlantic Ocean. And this whole area would have to be chopped down in order for rice cultivation. And of course, you know, the, there's people doing that, enslaved laborers. The indigenous people that were living there on the right-hand side is a conch shell that was inscribed, incised by the Guale uh, Native Americans that were living along uh, Georgia and South Carolina. On the left is a seagrass rice fanning basket. So, you know, you put the rice in it after the hulls are broken and you throw it up in the air and the weight of the rice drops back down and the wind blows the chaff out. But this is designed exactly the way that the baskets are made in Mali and Senegal. As a matter of fact, I just bought one 2019 from uh, a Senegalese person that looked just like that. One of the other things that enslaved laborers did was create some architecture that's called tabby, T-A-B-B-Y, tabby construction. It's made out of oyster shells and limestone to create a concrete. So this image on the left is from a plantation that's just outside of uh, Jacksonville. And uh, the, the structures are still there. You know, the, the wood part is gone, but the, the tabby and some of the brick is still there. And it's a, one of the national parks. And on the right is an island called uh, Sapelo Island. And this is where they were growing what's called Sea Island cotton. And this was supposed to be the best cotton grown in the United States. And let me also indicate that even though I do painting and drawing and sculpture, I also do photography. Okay, so, you know, these are my photographs that are part of my art practice and not just for documentation. This is another former plantation and, and going to be like on, on uh, Sapelo Island, the University of Georgia in Athens has a marine institute there, but otherwise nobody is allowed out on that island. And some of the other islands, they're barrier islands, unless you have permission either from the university or a local resident. And the local residents that are there are 
descendants of the formerly enslaved that still live there. Remember, this is not too far from where Armand Arbery was killed. So I was there the day that he was killed. I was in Georgia that day. This is another plantation. This plantation, the land originally belonged to Major Pierce Butler, one of the signatories to the Constitution. He's the person that wrote the Fugitive Slave Clause that said that it's your duty to return any runaways. And he believed that the uh, African diaspora was born to serve. That was their only purpose in life was to serve. The house that's there is not his house. That house, I forget who built it, but the last person who lived in it was R.J. Reynolds from the tobacco company. But now most of these former plantations along Georgia's coast are wildlife management areas. So there's a footpath, a berm there between on the right, which is freshwater, and on the left, which is freshwater, but it's going out to the ocean. So this is Butler River to the left and part of the plantation on the right. And so this was part of the construction method that I was talking about that the enslaved population knew because they were doing it, you know, a thousand years along the west coast of Africa to cultivate rice. That's a copy of the slave clause. Actually, the handwriting there is not very good compared to most of the handwriting I saw. So I got a very nice grant from Ulite and also from Locust Projects to help me with my project. And I went to uh, Duke University and looked in some of the archives. And these letters were found just the way that you see them there. So apparently there was not a lot of paper available. But, you know, you can read this. I, I blurred most of the text, so you can't really read it. Some of the words can be read, but most of them cannot. And so these were two prints that I did based off of the, the archive from Duke University that I found. As I mentioned, uh, drawing on African Native American traditions, healing in diasporan and maroon communities is linked to bodies of ritual knowledge and practice, which include divination, spiritual intervention, and the use of organic substances. This body of knowledge is beyond an art practice, but walking put me on this path. Now, these seeds were found when I was in Suriname. I don't remember what they were because we went all through this whole area so fast, it just looked like a bunch of weeds. Again, you know, when we're looking at it, you know, we have to recognize that when we're thinking about monocrop culture, which is what arrived in the Americas through the European colonization, actually kills off a lot of the environment and actually leaving it like this with all kinds of other plants that can help grow between plants you know, something gives off nitrogen and something else needs nitrogen. So it can do that naturally instead of using chemicals to do it. I'm showing this because in a, a recent uh, book that was uh, published in Europe, my photograph, actually it was, I sent them the image and they put it in a book, but the book is about mushrooms. So there's a bunch of artists from all around the world of various kinds of mushrooms and I've, I haven't been able to read it. I don't read Dutch. If it was Spanish, I could read it, but I don't read Dutch. But anyway, I just got it with, you know, within the last couple of weeks. So I'm, I'm really happy that I was able to make a contribution to that. Again, you know, I, I took these serpentine designs and started doing these serpentine designs based on my knowledge of the insect architecture. And I've been, like I said, doing silk screening, uh, printmaking, shall I say, since the 1960s. Here again, you know, in this transitional period between Art Center and California College of the Arts, so I did some silk screens and photographs. So this was a, originally was a silk screen that I did. The model was a friend of mine that's now deceased, a high school friend. So I, I reclaimed that. So I had four images of that. I made it into a folder. So it was like a mirrored image. So I cut them in half. So I had four and did, did four separate pieces, individual works from that. But again, using silk screen as one of the, the methods for creating that. 
on the left is one of the works that I did while I was at um, Anderson Ranch. The red leaf at the bottom is hand painted and hand cut. That's kind of the way I've been working in the past few years is doing a lot of collage. So even though this is a print, it's still a unique print. And the fact that, you know, the cut's going to be different, the painting is going to be slightly different. And so I did a small edition of that on the right hand side. So I'm just trying to show you how I've taken from my walks and my experiences, how I bring those things into my art practice. Um, on the right was based on, I just recently did this, but this was based on my experience from 2014 in San Miguel de Allende in Mexico. I've had a interest in vultures since before I moved to Florida. So that's going back to the 1970s. I haven't really shown, uh, put a lot or entered a lot of that into my art practice because as a spiritual being, I didn't feel that it was really appropriate at the time to do that. But now I'm, I'm feeling differently about it. And so I've, over the past couple of years, I've been putting more vultures into my work. And actually I spent a lot of time in um, the last residence in the Everglades in December photographing and following around the vultures, even though it was pretty wet out there. But that was probably one of the main things that I saw when I was there every day was full of vultures just circling the sky. It was beautiful, you know. On the left, unfortunately, the scale is not really showing you. But on the left was another piece. The gold leaf at the bottom is hand cut and collaged onto a silk screened image, which I did at Anderson Ranch just, you know, in February. And this is pretty large, it's like uh, 18 by 24. And the right hand side is uh, laser cut steel, only 12 by 12 inches. So it's pretty small in comparison. So my ideas about vultures in the Everglades kind of revolved around this story that I was writing about a body of vultures that I call spirit beings. Vultures do not fly at night. They only fly during the daytime. But these vultures in my myths are night flying vultures. And so this was one of the images that I created based on that. I'm still working on that series. And on the right hand side, there's a little bump on the tree branch there, the pine tree. That's a vulture that was resting just before going off into the roost, which is further west. Also, while I was in the Everglades, I took a GoPro underwater camera because I wanted to see what was under the water because I know Everglades is about water. And this was one of the images that I took. And I was just so surprised because from the surface, it doesn't look anything like that. And um, I showed that to the uh, park manager, superintendent rather. And he said he had never seen anything like that. So it's nice to be able to be there and see something new that you haven't seen before. And so I'm, I'm still working with some of those images. I haven't really had enough time to really go through and, and, and work with all those images because I was in the, the Anderson Ranch residency and then my father died. And I'm still trying to work through a bunch of things. Last summer, I did a residency with uh, IS Projects, Nocturnal Press a book residency, bookmaking residency, and I made this book. It has about 26 pages I'm using silk screen, photographs, laser cut, and letter press, uh, letter set, letter type press. And then it's hand sewn together. It was a beautiful book. I mean, I was really honored and, and happy the way that it came out. And everybody that has made a purchase says they love it. You know, it's all being sold through them. It's a, it's a beautiful book. I, I love it. I'm really happy that I was able to do that. And this page that I have laid out in every book is different because I had to hand paint that through a process that then got silk screen. So it was kind of an interesting process, but it was beautiful. So this is also um, something that I started and finished just recently, again, with the vultures and the mushrooms. Uh, this is another underwater photograph from the Everglades, along with seeing some invasive species fish there. One of them is a peacock trout, 
and the other one is an invasive species. And that's me there along with the side of the canal in the Everglades. And um, I, I want to thank everybody for being here this evening. And uh, I guess after a little break, we can have a Q&A. And um, thank you. Thank you. Onaji Day, that was so wonderful. I've I've been seeing you. I, I think I went longer than I was planning to. No, no, no. There's no such thing. We time is not of importance here. I think it was just about perfect. Um, I've been seeing your work for a lot of years now. I think I've known you for about ten years. I never understood where where the images were coming from. And I've learned so much, and I think other people have as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.